God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy words shall praise, shall praise thy earth and sky and sea. trust the good Lord is giving you a good one. I'm giving into this lesson on the Holy Spirit and part one, the critique of Dr. Hill's book on holiness and power. And uh, as you've seen already, there'll be 410 verses in all as we go through this five semester hour course. That means you have a lot of work to do. You can get the book online. You can get a hardback like, where did I put it? <clears throat> you can get a hardback like mine, or you can get a digital download. And uh, we'll be looking at that as we go along. The first quote that I want to give you is page five. We have avoided all fanciful and doubtful and forced interpretations of Scripture. So as we progress in this study, I ask you the question, or ask myself the question, what is fanciful, what might be doubtful, and what might be a forceful interpretation? And in looking at that, your first question, your first assignment, as you've seen already, is to formulate a definition and understanding of those five terms, holiness, sanctification, justification, perfection, and sinlessness. Because your understanding of those terms in and of themselves will help your understanding and interpretation of not only Dr. Hill's book, in my comments, but the Holy Scripture itself as you read and study. Next quote from Dr. Hill is page six. For the sake of strength and accuracy of statement, we have used in discussions the Revised Standard Version. 
at the expense of pleasant familiarities to the general reader. Or as I would say it, at the expense of the authorized King James Version of Holy Scripture that was given to us in 1611 in your current English edition. So question two. This book was published in 1897. So how did the author come to the conclusion that the Revised Standard Version was superior and more accurate to the King James Version, which I will be using throughout this course? Question three for you. What difference might this make in the author's understanding and interpretation of Scripture as opposed to that given in the authorized version? For personal understanding of the authorized version, if you take the course BI 100 Bible and we make a clear presentation of what the Bible says about the Bible, uh, along with comments and uh, statements by other people and other organizations uh, for and or against the King James Visal as opposed to some other translation or the original documents. So if you're interested in that subject, enroll in Bible 100 Bible. Oh, digging into chapter 1, the disease of the church. He begins with a lot of verbiage, and he quotes uh, a number of personals uh, like Moody and Spurgeon, and Wesley and some others, which will come up along the way. And I will not disparage any of these men's personal testimony. That's not the point of this study. This part one is a critique on the book by Dr. Hills in the things that he says in his interpretation and understanding and expression of Holy Scripture. And of course, from our perspective, the King James Version. This next quote, verse, uh, page 17. At the time of his ascension, that of Jesus, it numbered 120. So, next question, was it 120 or was it 500 plus? What does the scripture say? Did he get it right or wrong? Next quote from him, verse 20, I keep saying verse, but chapter, a verse, page 24. The truth is, there is something sadly defective in the education of the ministry and of the church. Something lacking. Hmm. For education in the church, what should be called discipleship, you should get my three courses, Crucified with Christ, Book 1, Book 2, and Book 3. And that will carry you from the freshman to a master builder, to a doctor of discipleship for your church and organization. Question two. If the author thought that the education for ministry was bad in 1897, what might he think of education in your church or organization today? Well, this course is the beginning of education on the Holy Spirit. And we hope to do our best to give you that education. Uh, as you've seen this 410 questions and a lot of scripture to go with it is going to give you a lot of information to digest. Next quotes on page 25. The spiritual death it carries in its train will only be known when the millions it has swept into hell 
stand before the judgment. There are going to be many at the final judgment, the white throne judgment, who are going to stand up and accuse us of not doing our job in spreading the gospel. Now, I'm just going to be just as guilty as you are in not doing the best I could. Question three. How would this deal with sanctification and holiness? Page 25. We do indeed surely need to get back to the Pentecostal experience and its subsequent holiness and power. That's what he believes. You'll get the Pentecostal experience, Acts 2, then you will get the Holy Spirit in all of its power and all of its holiness. And we'll find out more what he believes about that as we go along. Question 5. It is, is it absolutely necessary to have the Pentecostal experience to be a soul winner. Question six. Why does the church at large fail in evangelism? There's so many churches in this world and so many more people. Why has Bible-based evangelism failed? Page 29. And all this while the Christian church, the bride of Christ, as Brother Moody says, is walking hand in glove with the world, or what is worse, is indolently sleeping in its guilty embrace. Question 7. As the glove of the world and the hand of the church become one. If the church in the world was as Moody said in 1800, how could it be described today? Is the unholiness of the body of Christ today's world due to a lack of spiritual fullness? I believe it is. Page 30. In other words, the church is training gospel hardened candidates for damnation. Question 8. This statement is made in respect to the lack of converts by the church. What is the level of evangelism in your church? Are you training? The world, are you turning the world upside down or what? Why are there few converts where you go? There are no scriptural references in this page. So, for chapter one, your assignment is to answer the eight questions asked in this chapter. And that'll be due in about one week. Chapter 2. Questions and definitions. Page 31. Is there a bomb in Gilead for the hurt of the bride of Christ? Well, I would ask, what does Gilead have to do with the Bride of Christ? That's just my question, not yours. I did a minor prophet study of prophecy, and as part of that, I did a study of Gilead because Gilead is frequently mentioned throughout the minor prophets. So if you want to see a definition of 
Gilead and get the minor prophets study. Your question one here, is there an answer to the question? What bomb would you supply? Page 31, Jesus speaking, John 17, 19. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified. Question 2. If sanctification means the total eradication of of original and personal sins. What need for Jesus to be sanctified? What then is the definition of the word sanctified in this verse? A full discussion on the word sanctified is in the study Bible 306 on Hebrews Lesson Plan 26, titled Sanctification, or Sanctified. And you will find much detail there. Verse, chapter, page 31-32. Webster defines sin as, one, transgression of the law of God, disobedience of the divine command, any violation of God's will, either in purpose or or conduct, moral deficiency in character. Two, sin is the act of a moral agent in violating a known rule of law. Original sin, as generally understood, is native depravity of heart, that want of conformity of heart to the divine will, that cor corruption of nature or determination of the moral character of man which manifests itself in moral agents by positive acts of disobedience to the divine will. There you have a good definition of sin. He gives three positions on moral depravity on page 32. One, those who affirm that all sin lies in the wrong action of the will and that there is no moral depravity of nature from which we need salvation. Two, those who hold that sin is both voluntarily transgression and a sinful constitution which is the source of transgression, for both of which we are responsible, but from which we cannot be saved completely in this life. Three, those who hold that we have both actual sin of the will and a corrupt nature, from both which we may be saved in this life which is question three. What in your scriptural definition of moral depravity, what is yours? Is total redemption available while living in this world? Can you live above sin or not? Speaking of fitting, page 34. He argued that the theory of a corrupt nature received by inheritance reflects upon the goodness of God. In other words, he didn't believe it. Question four. Is Finney right in saying we do not have a corrupt nature from birth? Question five. Define the corrupt nature as given in these verses. Jeremiah 7, 9, 17, 9, Genesis 8, 21, John 3, 6, Ephesians 
Ephesians 2, 3, Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, and Romans 8, 7 and 8. Now, supposedly, in the handout with all the questions, these verses are also listed. Further argument for the moral corruption of mankind. As you look around this world, do you really need an argument? Page 36. The covenant of which circumcision was the seal and the repetition of it in infant baptism to those who practice it is a sign that children are in a state of pollution and need cleansing grace. As a Baptist, we do not believe in infant baptism because they cannot confess Christ. Question 6. Discuss circumcision from Galatians 5.6, Galatians 5.16, Colossians 3.11 and relate to Christian baptism. Is there a relationship? Page 37. It is this sense of inward corruption that gives the unrest of soul to earnest Christians and causes them to cry in anguish O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that's from Romans chapter 7, verse 24, by the Apostle Paul. And it says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So question 7. Paul was converted in Acts 9, about A.D. 40. Paul wrote the book of Romans around A.D. 59. That's about a 10-year span of time for Christian growth. Understanding this time span from conversion to writing Romans, how would you define Paul's understanding of man's natural corruption? Page 38. He will carry with him an ever-present evidence of the corruption of human nature, an evidence that will last till sanctifying grace has made him a full partaker of the divine nature. And that divine nature is taken from Second Peter 1 4, which is your question number eight. Partaking of the divine nature saves you from what? Page 39. Hence, if men are not by nature corrupt, it is possible to live free from all sin so as not to need the atoning blood to wash away our sins or the Holy Ghost to renew our hearts, this would be subservient to the whole gospel system. Dr. Charles Hodge, he further thought that sanctification is never perfect in this life, that sin is not in any case entirely subdued, so that we must advance believers so that the most advanced believer has need to pray for forgiveness of sins. I did that yesterday. Reverend Ashbury Lowry, Doctor of Divinity, but according to scriptures there is a point of culmination in grace that belongs to this life. A state in which, according to Paul, we stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. 
Colossians 4, verse 12. This is the finished work of salvation from sin we call entire sanctification or perfect holiness. Colossians 4.12 Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently in prayer, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Indicative that they have not arrived. Question 9. In the context of Colossians 4 and the above quotes, explain the words perfect, complete, and the will of God. So at the end of this chapter, your assignment is to answer those nine questions. preferably in the next week. Chapter 3. Doctrinal and philosophical hindrances. So there's some doctrines and some philosophy that's going to get in your way of getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost according to Dr. Hill. Page 43. No man is able, either of himself or by any grace received in this life, to keep the commandments of God, but daily does break them in thought, word, or deed. That's one of those hindrances and doctrines that he says gets in the way. So question one, is this statement absolutely true or not? Is it possible to live without sin or disobedience? Do we necessarily sin every day? And to that I would say, no, we do not. But more than likely we do. Page 44. As a matter of course, we must make God a liar. That is, discredit his revealed word or utterly dismiss from mind and thought all expectation and rational intention to render obedience. Thus the young convert is taught he cannot receive grace sufficient to obey God, but must daily sin in thought, word, and deed. Yet he has divine assurance that however he sins, he will not utterly fall away from God. Question 2. Discuss the above comments in accord with Hebrews 6 verses 1 to 6, Hebrews 10 verses 38 and 39, and 2 Corinthians 12 9. Going to make God a liar or not? On page 44, the author gives a tirade against the notion of the sin nature cannot be wholly eradicated. He calls for total sanctification with salvation to the uttermost, <coughs> which in his mind means you never sin again. Question 3. Discuss with 1 Timothy 6 9, Romans 7 23, 1 Thessalonians 5 23, and Hebrews 7 25. Do you never sin again? Page 46. President Finney, he was president of Oberlin College. 
A man cannot be holy and sinful at the same time. A man's obedience is entire or he is not obedient at all. It is nonsense to speak of a holiness that consists with sins. All true saints, while in a state of acceptance with God, do actually render for the time being full obedience to all known requirements of God. That is, they do for the time being their whole duty, all that God at this time requires of them. One day, my dad and Pastor Nelson were discussing what is, makes a perfect Christian. They concluded that a perfect Christian is one who is walking in the light he has. So I would conclude that a newborn believer is perfect before God. In Christ. Question 4. In consideration of the above, answer these questions. What part of the Mosaic Law was fulfilled in Jesus? What part is required for holiness? Who decides? What is the relevance of James chapter 2? Page 48. Rebellion is inconsistent with a scriptural idea of entire sanctification. When I read this page, I took note and wrote down, When I take a walk to meditate and pray, I most always break out with a song. Yet I would not consider myself to be totally sanctified as in the sense that this author gives. On the other hand, in the cleansing power of the blood, I believe I stand perfect before Jesus Christ. Verse, uh, page 53. I'll get that right sooner or later. Take the Holy Spirit and Jesus by faith as your sanctifier to will and to do in them. This is the only keeping power. The apostles and early disciples when filled with the Holy Ghost were cleansed and kept and then only. My dad told me that he received the second work of grace about two years after he was converted. He believed that after that he never sinned again. My mother lived with him for 63 years, and I lived with him for 17 years, and I don't think either one of us would agree with that. The problem comes in what is your definition of sin? The Catholics have mortal and venial sins. Your small insignificant venial sins, like adultery, can be forgiven by the Catholic priest. Your mortal sins, like murder, cannot be forgiven. The First Church of God, headquarters in Anderson, Indiana, has sins and mistakes. Hmm. So my dad didn't commit sins. He just made a lot of mistakes. So I guess that means I have too. Question five. What is your understanding of these things from your learning and experience? I gave you some of my testimony about me and my dad. What is your testimony and experience in these things? Page 55. The early church remained in prayer 10 days for God's sanctifying spirit to come. Suddenly he came. 
And from that moment, they were sanctified men. Question six. In the context of Acts chapter two, the scripture used the term sanctified, does it? Is it there? If on the day Peter was sanctified, holy, then why was he carried away in Galatians chapter 2? That's your question 6. Page 62. The divine order of Christian development is first purity, then growth to maturity. If the church member would all seek second experience, such as will be described in this book, the sanctifying cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, we would hear less about weak and worldly churches, but we would behold multitudes of stalwart Christians, men and women like Barnabas. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. The author indicates that the church at his time, when he wrote the book, was worldly. I wonder what he would think of the church in the world today. Question 7. Barnabas and Paul were both filled with the Holy Ghost. Why did they have such a disagreement over John Mark and Acts? Chapter 15, verses 37 to 39. Pardon my fault. President Mayhem, uh, they have the page wrong here. I got page four, but we don't pass that. Probably 64. President Mayhem. No doctrine can be less scriptural or more manifestly unscriptural than is this, that all believers are in this, in this dispensation baptized with the Holy Ghost at the time of their conversion. Question 8. True or false? Do all converts believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost at conversion. And I would add, if they do, then what happened to the power to witness and live the holy life? Page 67. When a young man gave himself up to seek the blessing, and when he obtained what seemed to him the thing he sought, there came to be less confidence that he had made substantial progress. He put the emphasis on getting the Holy Spirit and lost his confidence. What does that say? If Regeneration and sanctification take place at the same time. Always always coexist. The apostles were in error when they ordered the churches of their day to cleanse themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Page sixty seven. That's 2 Corinthians 7 1. Listen to it. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Notice the term let us and cleanse ourselves. That's a big difference between the Holy Spirit doing something 
to you and you doing something to and for yourself. And then you add the words perfecting holiness. Perfecting is not an end word. It's an ongoing word. The I and G means going and going and going. It's not a performance that the Holy Ghost is going to do to help you. It is one you are called upon to do yourself. I'll call your attention to Colossians chapter 3. And in Colossians chapter 3, you'll find a lot of wording of put off the things of the old man and put on the things of the new man. And I, long a time ago, developed a, a study of Colossians chapter 3 and made it into a prayer. And then uh, a couple years ago, I rewrote it and made it a personal prayer about for me. And then I put it in this little book that called My Prayer. Apparently, that is the last one I have. But if I get some requests, I can have it reprinted. Not much, but it takes about 10 bucks to get it done. Page 68. At the heart's purification is the work of the Spirit subsequent to regeneration is the teaching of Scripture. Question 9. Going again to 2 Corinthians 7 1, how would you understand this last statement from page 68? 7 1 says, We do it. And now he's saying the Holy Spirit does it. So which is it? Next, four quotes. Page 69, 77, and 79. First quote, we have a charming philosophy now that makes all Christians sanctified and rules out all second experiences as unsuited to the new order of things. <coughs> but with that going, has gone that abiding power of the Holy Spirit <coughs> that one made Oberlin the wonder of the Christian world. Pardon me. I do have some throat difficulties. Which my medical professionals have not been able to figure out. <clears throat> Quote number two. Holiness, and perhaps attaining it, and at once they are sneered at and criticized and berated and persecuted. It is because the average minister from sheer ignorance, does not know what to do with them, <clears throat> not discerning that it is the most hopeful indication of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church. <coughs> Quote number three. Liberal preaching has never reached the people permanently. The men in all Evangelistic pulpits who are seeking to cut down the doctrines to a minimum do not gather to the people or have revivals. If anything in the history of the church has proved a failure, it is the power of liberalism to reach the masses, as any religion is not a conquering, as easy religion is not a conquering religion. The problem with Evie believes him. Quote number four. We have tolerated too many brilliant, erratic, 
preachers who have enjoyed an unlimited amount of free newspaper press and advertising and have become undeservedly famous. You know any famous preachers? <laughs> Turn on your boob tube and you'll find a lot of them. Brings us to question 10. From these last four statements, how would you assess the education and ignorance of the body of Christ concerning the Holy Spirit? That's the end of this assignment. And so you, your assignment is to answer the 10 questions given in this chapter. And that's where we will stop until next time. This is Dr. Ken Larry.